Brisk Flicks. What up, nerds? Welcome to Brisk Flicks. I'm Alex Brisson, and this is a show where I watch movies and talk about them. Today we're watching the 2003 disaster flick slash underground space adventure, The Core. And when I say underground, I don't mean hip and unheard of. I mean, it literally takes place underground. It's a pretty shameless Armageddon ripoff all the way down to the identical posters. The core of the Earth has stopped spinning. How could this have happened? That's right, the Earth's core has stopped rotating, which causes Earth's electromagnetic field to disappear, creating all sorts of crazy global disasters. Turns out the Earth, much like myself, has a weak core. <laughs> 32 people's pacemakers randomly stop working in Boston. Not everyone's pacemakers all over the world. Just 32 people in Boston. Huge flocks of pigeons start killing themselves in London. There's a lightning superstorm in Rome in which the lightning specifically targets national landmarks. The Coliseum becomes target to hundreds of lightning bolts, whereas every other building in the scene remains weirdly untouched. And a gap opens up in the ozone layer, causing solar winds to melt the Golden Gate Bridge. I know, this sounds like a lot already. Uh, you're right, it is a lot. This movie is a lot. Okay, hang on, this isn't gonna be subtle. So the government is like, Pigeons are dying, damn it! We've gotta get our best men on this. Enter Aaron Eckert, a boring geology teacher who can't even tie a tie, but always has a witty retort for any situation. Yes or no, sir? Uh, the first one. He explains that if we can't get the core restarted within one year, then Earth's electromagnetic field will disappear and the sun will melt us. This is the sun, this is the Earth. You might have noticed the science in this movie is dumb. Which brings us to our next segment. I beamed high powered electromagnetic energy waves down deep earth fault lines and you know. The science in this movie was so wildly inaccurate that it actually inspired a movement to bring more accurate science to sci-fi movies. Science fiction is always at its best when it's got science at its core. Co -co core. Science is not a negligible part of storytelling. It isn't just inaccurate, it's an affront to science. Scientists were offended by this movie. That's when I jump up and say, learn some science, bring in a science advisor. It matters what's true. I'm no scientist, but I did find an interview with physicist John Ortberg where he ripped this movie limb from limb. He started by pointing out how outrageous it was to suggest that a human EMP device would be forceful enough to stop the Earth's core from rotating. He said that's akin to using a small desk fan to dissolve a thunderstorm. What if the core is made of cheese? This is all best guess, Commander. That's all science is, is best guess. The movie says that if the Earth's core stops rotating, then that we'll all be burned up by the sun in a year's time. But according to Dr. Ortberg, that would happen pretty much instantaneously. What's going on? We don't know, sir. Oh boy, what else? There's a million things. The sun melts through the steel beams of the Golden Gate Bridge before it burns through the roofs of the cars. They'd never be able to radio communicate with each other through 4,000 miles of solid rock. Come on, guys, I can't hear you. And then there's this whole thing suggesting pigeons would just fly straight into walls if there wasn't an electromagnetic field. Little ions in their brains align with the magnetic field of the Earth. Yeah, what she said. Right? <laughs> This movie does feature some of the dumbest techno babble I've ever heard. This is a superheated hyperfluid of molten iron and nickel at 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,000 miles down, 1,000 miles thick. A trillion, trillion tons of hot metal spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. High frequency pulse lasers with resonance tube ultrasonic. Planet Earth needs a colonoscopy, so we gather the best of the best. Hilary Swank, as a pilot who is plagued by being too competent and is somehow better at everyone else's jobs than they are. I'm sorry, this is really delicate, and I have it just the way I want it. It's better. I'm sure that's an issue we can all relate to. Is there anything you can't do? Not that I'm aware of. Stanley Tucci as the world's most pompous scientist. Do you have any idea who I am? Do you have any, oh, okay. you have hey, any idea hey, who let's I just, am? Just... Delroy Lindo as a scientist who builds and falls in love with Virgil, the ship that they use to travel to the center of the Earth. What's worth dying for? This ship. Bruce Greenwood as the captain who offers fatherly advice. Being a leader isn't about ability. It's about responsibility. We have Serge. 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 Who constantly reminds us how much he loves his wife and two kids. I came here to save my wife and my two children. I love my Your wife. That's why I'm still in love with her. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to him. And DJ Qualls, the geeky virgin from Road Trip. You guys saw Road Trip, right? DJ Qualls is a super annoying hacker character. You guys aren't here to whack me, are you? Because I was really, really hoping to have sex before that happened. This character annoys the living 
fuck out of me. Every single thing he says and does is annoying. You want me to hack the planet? I'm gonna need an unlimited supply of xenotapes and hot pockets. So uh, I'll just uh, hack the entire world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got free long distance on that phone forever. And that bunch makes up our core cast. Apparently it's super important to the government to keep the public from finding out the world is ending in spite of these crazy apocalyptic events happening left and right. It's called VirusBot. It's a computer virus that'll seek out files anywhere on the web that contain keywords we designate and wipes them out. Which, if anything, would just cause a greater panic because obviously everyone can see that the world is ending, but now for some reason, whenever we try to post about it online, the post is promptly deleted. Can you imagine what that news report would sound like? In other news, thousands of lightning bolts rained down upon Rome today, while in America, the Golden Gate Bridge has melted. Scientists have literally no explanation for the events, but we're sure everything is fine. Finally, a full hour into the film, we're starting our adventure. Our characters pile into their, uh, drill ship thing, and they drop down towards the center the Earth. From this point, it's a pretty typical space adventure flick, and if you're not familiar, it's pretty much just an entire genre of people looking at screens and shouting out numbers. A lot of times numbers that we don't even have any context for. 800 feet. 429. 4,000 feet. 18,000. 14,000 feet. 18,000. 21,000. 3,000 yards. 5,800 feet. 37.243.432. Coming right at us! Ah! And the graphics on these screens are pretty much entirely indiscernible. How would anyone possibly comprehend that? Alfre Woodard's entire role in this movie seems to just be staring at screens concerned. But you can tell it's exciting. Just look at our hero's expressions. So we get to the bottom of the ocean and we drill into the earth, which gives us our first real look at the special effects. And they're a bit rough around the edges. It's just one shot after another where you just cannot tell what's happening. It just looks like a dildo flying through a lava lamp. It's partially a product of its time, but a lot of these things they're trying to animate are just literally impossible. Like if we're showing a ship drilling through solid rock, then there's really no space for the camera to even exist in. It's as if we're diving through the memories of the planet. The movie's release was delayed by six months so they could continue to work on the effects, but honestly, I think these guys needed like two more years. God, I hate this guy. I imagine the conversation between the special effects guys and the producers looks something like this. 10 years, 10 years. What would it take to get it done in three months? One of the major solutions the writers came up with was to have us look at everything through this viewer screen. Not very good reception. Which gives us an excuse to use a whole bunch of half-finished special effects in the movie, so we spend half our time looking at amorphous crap like this. It's kind of unreal how often they cut to this thing. It looks like a screensaver from the 90s. But then this happens. What do you make of this? It's empty space. I never taught the computer how to read empty space. That's right, empty space, because what could be easier to animate than literally nothing? So the ship crash lands and we have to go out and jumpstart the engine. But there's a problem. The only way out of the ship is the way we came in, which is through the impeller outlet. It which is still at 5,000 degrees. Exactly. The propeller is directly in front of the door to get out of the ship because that makes sense. Thankfully, Delroy has a solution. I'll just flush it with liquid nitrogen from the cooling system. Seconds later, they're out of the ship. Which might leave you asking, why even bother to include that conflict with the propeller being over the door that made no sense if it was handled that easily? This may be the worst science of the entire movie because at this depth, there would be about 800,000 pounds of pressure per square inch pushing down on these people but they just throw on these rubber suits and walk outside and they're fine. Looks like the suits can take the pressure. This is when our heroes discover something truly spectacular. It's magnificent. Oh my god. How oh, that is cave. It's like a crystal grand canyon. Is that it? Like, whoops, uh, we can really see the effects budget running out since they didn't even bother to animate all of these crystals. We just have these little twinkling lights off in the distance. They left it to the imagination. So while our heroes are jumpstarting the engine, lava starts falling down through the crystals. Bruce Greenwood is chilling on this crystal, floating the lava directly in front of the lasers, doing God knows what, when suddenly this happens. So now we're back on the road again, but wait, there's another twist. Destiny is a go. Repeat, destiny is a go. That's right, Project Destiny. It's a device. Deep Earth Seismic Trigger Initiative, D-E-S-T-I-N-I. -I. 
Destiny. Because that's how acronyms work. But every time Project Destiny is written on screen, it's spelled with a Y, so... Project Destiny does something that will cause the planet to end, I guess. It's just one more thing. There are a lot of just things in this movie being thrown in. It's like everything but the kitchen sink, and then maybe the kitchen sink too, just for good measure. There's so much happening, I didn't even have a chance to talk about like this scene where a rocket lands in the LA spillway. There's a whole thing with whales. This movie is a serious testament to how much you can jam into one production. I think what's really so exhausting about it is how much it's just constantly demanding your attention. Everything is big and loud. There's all these whip pans and snap zooms and everybody is shouting at every single moment. Back! And the score, most of all, is completely over the top. Which brings me to my next segment. Anthony Sabatino, aka Moose with a Scarf, is a film composer, conductor, and music producer. When it comes to film scores and composition, the Moose is an expert. The big thing about this film is that there's no subtlety to it at all. There's no peaks and valleys. It's all peak. It's all peak all the time. We're dodging diamonds the size of Cape Cod. The, the composer is Christopher Young, who is actually a teacher of mine at USC. He mostly does horror movies. Recently with like big disaster movies, we've gotten so used to the big Hans Zimmer kind of but this was 10 years before that. So it's still kind of more on the Star Wars John Williams influence where it's a much more thick orchestral, organic, kind of larger than life feeling. But it was also right around the time of Matrix. So they were trying to shoehorn in a bunch of electronic beats and grooves and synthesizers in there. So it became this weird Frankenstein monster. If I could describe the score in like one word, it would be bombastic. There's very few times where it might just be like a light string pad and then like a, a nice lyrical horn melody a la Binary Sunset from Star Wars. It, it's almost always there's like thick strings, like six horns playing the melody, and then maybe like woodwinds are doing kind of like... So just slow down, you're gonna give me a heart attack. And they think, okay, well, bigger is better, so let's just put more stuff into it, more instruments in the orchestra. Turn it up to 11, no, 12. Everything's gotta be big, big, big. It's always building, and then it's like one crescendo after another. It's like, and all their heads explode because it just gets so huge. The only thing that'll finally stop it is a literal nuke, and maybe a little subtlety will go a long way. Thanks for uh, putting this film on my radar. Thanks for joining us here. I'll see you later, Moose. Have fun down there. All right, I think he's gone. So 42 hours later, and it really does feel like 42 hours, we reach the planet's core. And it looks a lot like the lava level from Super Mario 64. <laughs> So one by one, our heroes die off in progressively more ridiculous fashions. Serge gets crushed, Delroy melts, Stanley Tucci is run over by a nuke. <laughs> But they're ultimately successful in their plan to nuke the center of the Earth, and they fly out of the core at record speed. We're gonna be home in a third of the time. But much like the film itself, they fall short of the finish line. This movie had a budget of 85 million, and it grossed only 74 million, which does make it officially a flop. Um. We lost some stick, and I... Our heroes are pulled up from the depths, which should be the ending, but there's this whole follow-up where they really want all of their dead friends to get famous. No one's gonna ever know what they did or why they died. No one's concerned about Serge's wife and kids. No one's worried about any of their families. It's just really important that they be famous. So DJ Qualls hacks everyone on the planet again somehow, this time from a Starbucks, and he tells everybody what really went down. And then the movie finally ends. That's the core. I will give them credit for being ambitious. It's nothing if not ambitious. Overall, I give this movie three out of seven dead pigeons. It's a fun watch, maybe with a break or two in the middle. Be sure to give this video a big thumbs up because because I desperately need the validation. Also make sure to subscribe so that you can always be the first to know if I post something new. It's just that button right down there, right below the, right below the viewer screen. I mean, or don't, whatever. I won't hold it against you. What movie should I talk about next? Beneath the Planet of the Apes? Robocop 2? Tremors 7? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye!